I don't think anybody has the right to say, well, you're Indian, you're not Indian. Someone said, well, what exactly does it mean to be a Mohawk? It's actually a hard question. It's a really hard question. And I really had to think about it. No one had ever asked me that question. I'm, I'm Mohawk, I'm proud of where I am, I'm from Ganawage, and I didn't know. I'm unsure sometimes because I don't have my language. I can't grasp on anything that makes me say that I'm a native, I'm a Mohawk. I have no idea what it means to be native. What are you doing later tonight? I have to perform in a play, a dramatic experience. What's it called? Sometimes when I dream. And who are you? I'm a native. That's me and my younger sister. Her name is Tiffany Wessendiosta. I consider her to be my best friend. We grew up on the Ganawage Mohawk Reserve near Montreal. Our childhood was filled with so many awesome adventures that we were kind of oblivious to the politics around us. Identity and membership meant nothing to us then, but not everyone was as lucky as we were. Those carefree times didn't last forever. And eventually, as we got older, we were introduced to the secret ugliness of belonging. <laughs> You're not gonna be my pants! <laughs> <laughs> well, growing up, okay, wait. <laughs> well, what do you remember about when we were kids? Okay. I remember growing up as kids. <laughs> so, growing up. Yeah. Positive, negative memories. <laughs> pretty positive. I would say pretty positive. I always marveled that you just go down the street. Well, I marvel now, thinking back to it. But at the time, you know, you have an auntie on this corner, had an, another auntie living like if you walk down that corner, one block this way, there's another auntie. And all, everybody's got kids, so we had the cousins everywhere. There was that real, like, tight-knit community. And even all the neighbors, you know, being sent by mom to go across the street and get sugar, or I bake something, oh, let's go bring it over. Like, our street was called Sesame Street. And there was, and there was a reason, because there was tons of kids, there was tons of kids on that street. I am super enviro, protector of the environment. And you evildoers will be distinguished I remember realizing, like, knowing that we're Native, knowing that we were Indian, and knowing that what I heard in the trees and, like, the connection that I felt to the earth and stuff like that. When I would take my nature walks and just feel, like, so at home and so at peace and, like, questions answered because I had this deep connection to the land. But I was feeling, like, really comfortable and really, like, proud in a sense of... Like that, that inner knowledge that I was native in Mohawk. So what do you think of the dumplings? They're really good. It's a great treat when I come home. I remember a certain instance of being not ashamed of who I was, but being like kind of fearful. I was 10 years old and there was that sense of hate out there, especially like me knowing that it was out there. I called the radio station to request a song from mom. And they asked, who's it for and where, like, where are you from? And I said, it's for my mom. I said my name. But then I froze. I was like, if I tell him I'm from Ganawage, he's not going to play my song. And he might say something bad. You know, he might call us down or whatever. So I lied. You know, but that was like a moment where, where I was like worried about who I was because of things that were out there. And you know that feeling when everything seems like it's moving along. Just how you want it, just how you want it, and then a little shift or a little side shift. You come screaming, fighting, and you want as the whole thing goes up. The 
summer of 1990 was a time of courage and contempt. It all began with a peaceful protest to protect a Mohawk burial ground from being destroyed for a golf course. But it quickly erupted into a summer-long standoff between us and the Canadian military. Sadly, many of our neighbours did not understand, and they made sure we knew it. Okay, well, I was 14 at the time during the Yucca crisis, and I saw a lot of awful, awful stuff. <laughs> uh, to see all the, the race riots, I was amazed to see that existed. You know, I knew of racism as a kid, but I could confront that, and I could, and, and that's kids being ignorant, but when you see adults and stoning cars and freaking, and just going crazy, it was really scary. It was just so unreal. <laughs> unreal to be there. I'd walk out of the house with the food to, to go deliver it to the warriors from bunker to bunker and you'd hear like them yelling, oh, we're gonna get you, we're gonna rape you, we're gonna, and that was like daily, daily stuff. We were going out there and this is like, they're coming through the pines and they're coming and setting up all the barbed wire and there's like tanks coming in and I'm just like, my heart's racing and I'm trying not to be scared and like guns everywhere and and just trying to be that brave warrior that I really didn't feel like. <laughs> like I felt like a scared teenager, but I'm looking around at me and going, okay, nobody else is scared, well I might, I gotta be tough. And at the end, getting stabbed um, when we were leaving the treatment center. All I wanted to do is get my little sister to safety. She was screaming like, I'm scared I'm gonna die. Like this screech. And there's like fights going on everywhere and she's freaking out, I'm crying, everything. It's like the world was coming to an end. And I, I, I remember getting to the, almost to the press barricade and I got, I got hit. Like it was like someone had just knocked the wind out of me. And I was like, and I couldn't breathe. And then someone kicked the feet, my feet out underneath me, and that's the picture. That's like my little sister on top of me. And I just remember feeling like my whole body was gonna explode with pain. I was scared, I was angry, I was terrified, I was so sad. I don't know, I got everything at once. Then we got herded onto the buses, and then that's when I looked down and I was like covered in blood. That's when life really like changed. My life changed. I stopped being a kid. It was the end of my youthful ignorance. Um, Rose-colored glasses were off, <laughs> you know. And um, and I suffered from a lot of reoccurring nightmares, panic attacks, anxiety attacks, for years. That's why I threw myself into sports. I threw myself into water polo. Like I became obsessed with it. I was in the water, and it was like oh. I was just playing water polo. Just just plain, just free, and uh, it was my release. It was really, I think, uh, you know, what saved my life. My name is Wonique Karakwinunta Onakaragete Sunshine Horn Miller, and um, my mom brought us up with a lot of the culture, history, you know, um, of who we were, and um, I only sought out native guys. I mean, man, I was raised, you know, you only date native guys, don't even think about non, I didn't even think about non-native guys. It wasn't even an op option because it's your job to perpetuate the nation as a Mohawk woman, but also too, I think in a lot of ways, I mean, I can't blame it all on my upbringing, but it's also my experiences at Oka, you know, kind of made me like a little wary of non-native guys. I was kind of scared. It's a choice and it's also an upbringing. You don't date non-natives. It's just the way it is. It's the unwritten rule of Kahnawake that everybody knows to this day. And uh, there's, you don't date a white person. You don't marry a white person. You don't bring a white person here. What else are there? There's so many single women because they won't go out and look for anybody else. 
beautiful, strong, good women who would make awesome, awesome wives and mothers. And There's under 20,000 Ganyakahaga people left in the world. When we're gone, there'll be nobody here to replace us. Oh, you don't have a baby with a white person either. Or a black person, or any other person who's not native. My name is Lauren, and tonight I am doing a burlesque show with the Blue Light Burlesque. It's called Audition Night because I've never done this before. So I'm going in as an amateur, and hopefully I'll get something out of it. And the idea is just to be very big and brassy and curly and sparkly, so we're gonna see how that turns out. Lauren? Well, she's going to college right now. She loves school. She's involved in so many different activities. Like she volunteers for different things, and she's been in theater since she was like four years old, five years old. She was doing drama in the community. She just loves life. She's like really alive. You know, she does everything. She's uh, got a good outlook on life. She's always seems to be happy about a lot of things, you know. She's awesome. Okay, so remember what we discussed yesterday. Mm -hmm. Not from the middle of nowhere. Bring it from the side. <laughs> I just turned 18 recently, and uh, I come from uh, a mixed background. My father's black and my mom is Mohawk. Both of my parents served in the military. That's how they met. And, uh... Yeah, I mean, like, I wasn't born in Kahnawake. I wasn't born into the reservation. Uh, I was actually uh, an American baby. <laughs> I lived in uh, Kansas for a year, and then we moved to Germany for two. And after my parents' divorce, we moved back to Kahnawake, and that was kind of um, a weird transition. Kids can be really mean, and uh, I, I don't really blame them. I think it's more of the message that their parents are sending to them, you know? So, I mean, like, for a while I was just really cautious about what I said to people about, you know, my father being, like, black. There's so much mixture in this town, you know, there's, like, nobody is 100% anymore. And, I mean, I think that comes from a real, I mean, if you think about it, all this, you know, fear of the outside, you know. I mean, I think it might just be a fear of what they know, like, ultimately know that, you know, they're not 100%, you know. And to prove it, they're going to be like, ah, you're white. You're black, you're this, you're that. I don't want you, like, anywhere around me. <laughs> this is Mohawk Miles, sponsored by the Youth Centre every year. It's an annual thing. It's just an activity for uh, people from Kahnawake to participate in. <laughs> If they choose, it's a race. You can have the option of either walking, running, or rollerblading. I'm doing the five kilometer walk. I don't, I don't run a rollerblade for anybody anywhere. Well, well, thank you for staying in the background and not making me feel you're the last one, which I always am. <laughs> Bottom feeder. <laughs> my name is Sandra Sherman. I have my mom and dad here. They're nearby, my sister and her husband and kids are nearby, and I have extended family and friends all over town. As a child and even as a young teenager, I experienced some animosity from the local kids who knew my father was a non-native. They knew he was from the uh, neighboring community, and I was, I was called Frenchman, even though I'm not French. My father's a non-native, but he's not French. He's just a regular old white Canadian guy but I was called Frenchman, and I don't belong here, and go back to Shadigui, and I had eggs thrown at my house, and... I had a lot of problems at school, in elementary school, with, with kids my age, you know. There's a park just uh, down the road from us. They were very tiny at the time, so they went, and you couldn't see there was kids sitting in, inside of a tree. They were hiding up in a tree. My kids kind of stopped as they were getting into the park, and they were looking up in the tree, I couldn't hear what was being said to them, but Jasmine came back. She was running and she was crying and she was like, they're calling us names and they won't let us play in that park. So I took Jasmine by the hand. I said, let's go back. You, you're going to play in that park if you want to. You're gonna, nobody can stop you from playing in the park. 
And as he got closer, you could hear them picking at Lauren and they were calling her a nigger. You know, get out of here, you nigger, you don't belong here. And this park is for Indians only. And I really got mad. They're little kids. They're only kids. They're, they're maybe the oldest one was maybe nine years old. I was so mad. I, you know, I was like, what do you say to, what do you say to kids like this? Like, what do you do? Like, ignorant. They're really ignorant things that, you know, they're saying. Around grade four, like, I, I got really, like, I just got fed up and I got into a fist fight. <laughs> I, three, I got into a couple of fights and uh, it's, I hit my bad peak <laughs> in grade four. And uh, I got kicked out of my fourth grade class and then I just really, like, this is stupid, you know. It didn't make me feel good at all. You know, I couldn't understand why. Like, yeah, my father's not native, but my mother's native. Doesn't that count for anything? And I live here. I live here in Ganawagi with you in the same reserve. Well, got one other person behind me. I think she's trying to race me to beat me. <laughs> Looks like I'm bottom feeder again. <laughs> That's okay. Hey! <laughs> I got the same thing from the Shadagi kids in the neighboring community. When I went to school there, and the non-native kids teased me because I was from Gunnawagi. Uh, what they call me? Uh, the usual native slurs. Uh, Savage and woggy and uh, tomahawk thrower and uh, making the usual Indian gestures that were just plain silly and I couldn't understand it either because yeah my my mother's Mohawk but <laughs> my father's from here Shadagi I'm here going to school with you and you're my friend and Christ's sake I look like you <laughs> you know I mean yes I look like my non-native father I don't have the uh, stereotypical dark skin or the dark hair but that can't really apply anymore here in Gunnawaga because of all the um, intermarriage which has been going on for oh, centuries now but yes I'm fair-skinned yes I'm fair-featured so I got picked on a little bit more because of that you think that coming from like like an ethnic background ourselves, you know, we're oppressed. Uh, as Native Americans, we've been oppressed. We, we've, like, we deal with racism, like, on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you, you think that we'd be the better of it, you know, like, uh, because of it and just, you know, it's the complete opposite, I find. People are just really, really, like, everyone's out to get them, so, I mean, they make everyone the enemy, you know? I thought that white people were there to harm us only. And that's it. Nothing else. There were no good white people out there. We're making ourselves prejudiced against one another. I just moved back away this August because of threats, my kids had, my van being vandalized, my home. I can't do it. Yeah, that's the way it was for most of my young my young adult life until I left. I was like 17 years old when I actually left. I wanted to get some place where you could start totally fresh, start totally new where nobody has like any stories about you. Nobody knows or expects anything, any judgments. I was more really interested in living, having adventures and like seeing the world. My sister went backpacking through Latin America camped out on the beach in Mexico, and eventually she ended up living in a community of social activists near Austin, Texas. I just kind of like let go and went free for a little while. I knew going away, if anything ever went bad, or if I was ever ready to like drop everything and go home. You know, Gunawagi was always like home. So it was kind of like a stepping, like a stepping out but knowing that you're, I was stepping back in later. And I think that was like a major reason why a lot of relationships didn't work in the beginning, knowing that it would never work out with these people because they're not from Gunawage. And like, you know, I can't like get too serious with them. Because? Because it wasn't allowed. I wanted to be the most native that I could. And if that meant 
I had to marry a native person and have like the most native child that I could and that's what I would do. And that kind of like stayed with me for a long, long time, that way of thinking. That it's gotta be done this way and there's no other options because, because that's the way it's gotta be. These people, like we all share the same ideas of living off the grid, living alternatively, living in the rhizome. Um, it's a warehouse and everybody kind of lives in like their set, you know, little rooms around the warehouse, but there's no like real private space there. So I met Andrew, who was more of an intriguing character in the beginning. Like, who is this person? Right from the beginning, we were like totally honest and totally open and talking about everything. Being told that we could never be together because of my race. At first blush, I was, I guess I was offended a little bit, you know? Not necessarily, yeah, maybe by her, but more just like the entire notion seemed, well, it just seems racist, you know? My reaction was one of, I guess, disbelief, really. The sun was setting and we were in the courtyard at Rhizome and uh, we had that conversation of like, you know what, I, I, I'm liking you a lot. Yeah, I'm really liking you too. Oh, cool. And, and, you know, and then like kind of romance kind of like sparking up from that. We really started like getting closer and I was still torn like, oh my God, what do I do? I remember one like certain conversation that I had called home. I was like, should I go with love or should I come home and, and keep trying like to find somebody at home? And I think I made up my mind just to follow my heart and to be happy and go with like what felt really good, go with, with what I wanted, what, you know, where it was taking me. Yeah, because like he is, he's, he's like, he's really great. I don't usually look at my feet. <laughs> There's no one at the park. We have the whole place to ourselves. <laughs> What's more fun, the swinging or the spinning? <laughs> the swinging. Oh, yeah? Shouldn't yeah. have told me. <laughs> <laughs> Here in Ganawaga, we have what's called the Mohawk Registry. I was never on it since the day I was born because when my mother married my father, she lost her rights as a native as per the Indian Act, which was in effect at the time. I grew up on this reserve, but I wasn't allowed to attend school here. I was bused off the reserve to school in the neighboring community. <laughs> to this day, uh, I'm, I'm not allowed to vote in our elections. I can't own property. I can't build a house if I chose to. If I die, I, I won't be able to be buried here, on, right on Mohawk territory, in my own cemetery. I'll probably be shipped to uh, Shadagi. Let me explain to you how this all came about. In 1876, soon after the birth of Canada, a law was passed called the Indian Act that set out to completely control the lives of Native people living within its borders. Fundamentally, its goal is to effectively assimilate all of Canada's Native people to make us disappear. The Indian Act is one of the most oppressive pieces of legislation that exists in any country in the world as far as I'm concerned. Uh, South Africa used it as a model to set up their apartheid system. You know, uh, you know how bad, you know how bad can it get? And yet, the the leaders in Canada pontificate of what a wonderful country they are. But it's a, it's a, it's a racist, assimilationist piece of of legislation, all all wrapped up in this right nice big bow that says we're going to do things for you. One of the most oppressive parts of the Indian Act is the fact that it dictates who is granted Indian status and who is not. This is done based on a blood quantum concept. A certain percentage of your ancestors have to be native for you to be considered officially native. There's a document somewhere that says I'm 37.5% Mo of Mohawk blood. They actually measure it. But what percentage am I? 100%? 71. Half white. 
full-blooded. 50 treats. One ounce of native blood. If you're 49.5 percent, you're you're not. Oh, you're only a half breed. Quarter blood, half breed. They're half breeds. Half breed, 50 percent. I'm less than 50 percent. How can you calculate that? It's stupid. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of ever. So if you made the cut, you were granted membership in a particular community and your name was placed on a ban list in that community. In the 1980s, Canada decided to allow bands to control their own membership, and a third of them have chosen to do so. My community is one of them, and after years of debate, the Gunnawagi membership law came into effect in 2004. The membership law was supposed to right all the wrongs that the Indian Act imposed on the town. One big issue was gender inequality. There are many women, like Sandra's mother, who married a non-native man. Their children were considered to be non-native, and never had membership in Gunawage. Not only that, but women like Sandra's mother lost their status and ended up having to leave the reserve. I love being a Mohawk person. I love Gunawage. When I go home to Shadi and I cross that bridge, I always feel bad. I feel bad in my heart that I can't be here. This is my home too. I never considered Shadi my home. I have a house there but I never considered my home. Here, I'd walk down the street. I knew everybody. All my relatives live here. I'm alone over there. It's all right. But for men who married out, it was a different story. I know many people who have a native father and a non-native mother, but are on the registry and have full rights. If you want to count blood quantum into it, they're just as Mohawk as I am, if not less. Canada made an attempt to rectify this problem in 1985 when they passed Bill C-31, which did grant Sandra her Indian status according to Canada. But that still didn't get her on the ban list in Gunawage because the community was no longer recognizing status granted through the Indian Act. What I hear, <laughs> it's a little club called membership. Uh, you have to uh, you have to make a, a written application, a request for membership. It's very intimidating. Also, you have to go against the council of elders and and, and plead your case why you want to be a member of the community. And you gotta prove how <laughs> how native you are. <laughs> for me, it's always been there. You know, I've always thought of myself as a Native American. I've lived here for like ever, <laughs> for for the majority of my life. To me, it's just a birthright that I think I deserve because I'm from Gunawage. <laughs> I'm not a stranger to this community in any way <laughs> and I belong here. Oh my god. I can't believe how many pages this thing has. Are you scared? Well, yeah, like I don't... Uh, some pretty heavy stuff here. A person who is not born of two members is eligible to apply for membership of Ginyakahaga of Gunawage at the age of 18 if he or she satisfies the following criteria. Has at least four Ginyakahaga great-grandparents. So is Bubba's grand, uh, granny's father and mother a Ginyakahaga? And Bubba's mother and father a Ginyakahaga? Bubba's mother is half. She's half? Yeah. But was she Ginyakahaga? Like, did she have a uh, membership here? She had status here. Is it the same as membership? I don't know. We'll have to check into that. Uh, speaks or is committed to learning Ginyakahaga. Something I wanted to do. I talked about yeah. doing that after a seizure. Um, respects mother early. Like, how do you prove that? Like, what are they going to say? Oh, last week I saw you throw some trash on the <laughs> Rejection. <laughs> So the new membership law gives hope, because blood quantum is not mentioned anywhere in its many pages. It also considers the quality of one's character as a Mohawk person. This is not even following customs and traditions either. Well, this no, whole this process is going against the tradition. Essentially, like, you were native if you had a clan, and that's passed on through your mother. So regardless of how much mixture is in it, on your family, as long as your mother had a clan, you'll have a clan. But I mean, like, even if you don't have a clan, you can get adopted into one. It's Come on, Gypsy. If she's got a clan, she's a Mohawk woman. <laughs> this is my home. You know, I want to be able to call it home. 
and I want my opinion to count and to matter and to have weight in the community, you know, and like, when I'm going out there doing positive stuff, people are going to ask where you're from, I want to be able to say, I'm from Gunawaga, and I like, you know, represent the community. If I don't get accepted, I just think that's complete BS, and I don't need a piece of paper to prove that, like, I know. So, I mean, this is more or less an experiment just to see, you know, how things are going to work out. Love you, Mom. Love you, too. The Olympics was like a, a movie set. You know, they had DJs there and they have light shows and laser shows and I remember the night before my first game, I remember calling my mom and my sister and going, how am I gonna see you in the crowd? How am I gonna see you? And my little sister grabs the phone and she's like, don't worry about it, we got it covered. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so the next day I'm marching out, looking up into the crowd, scanning the crowd and like my eyes were on like, my little sister had dyed her hair fire engine red. And she looked like a friggin' pom-pom or firework or something. And her face is all painted like Canadian flag. And then there's my mom kind of like just, just, just crying. She's just so, and I hadn't even touched the water, you know? Number 12, one eight, one Miller. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, you see your mom cry, you're like, what happened? Like, who was mean to her? <laughs> like, you know, really worried. And so they got in, played Russia, scored two goals, got out, went to the press place, ran upstairs to see my mom. and. I'm like, what happened? Why were you crying? And she goes, oh, no, no, no. She's just, it just, it just dawned on me, like, you were at the Olympics and you were achieving your dream. And, and um, I just, I just remember the promise I made you as a kid when you first said you wanted to go to the Olympics. I promised you I would do everything I could to help you. And over the years, I didn't think that I was gonna be able to do it. And through everything, she says, when you walked out, she said, I was so proud of myself as a mother. And that's why she was crying. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, like, and it was, um, I was really happy. My experience was always tied to my family and my community, always. It was like so important to me. So to make my mom and my community feel proud of themselves was really, really important for me. And it made me proud of myself that I could do that. I dug so deep into my spirit and it still didn't give me that medal. But that's the Olympics. At the end of my water polo career, what happened to me it's like my, my drug that kept all my real issues at bay was now gone and so I was flooding in and I was overwhelmed with all these, just with nightmares and anxiety and panic attacks and like I had full-blown post-traumatic stress at 27. And I can remember thinking to myself, I remember burning tobacco and saying, please, can, can, I, can the ancestor spirit, can great spirit or whomever, Send me somebody, I need help. I was really not doing well. I was suicidal, I was going through a very hard time. And uh, I just remember thinking, please, I need, I need somebody. And then in walked Keith <laughs> into my life. And I remember thinking to myself when I, I had met him at the Olympics briefly, he's a much more accomplished athlete than me. I just remember thinking he was cute, but he's white. You know, forget it. I mean, I can appreciate a good looking man no matter what race you are, you know, so. But um, I saw him again two years later. I was in a I don't care mode, screw that, screw this, I'm gonna do what I want kind of attitude. I was very much like basic needs. And I was like, oh, why not? You know, you're cute. What do I have to lose? You know, little did I know, someone who I thought was gonna be a one night stand turned out to be one of the best people I've ever known in my life. He brought with him a, um, a spirit, an energy that was so stable and strong and powerful in a way that, in a lot of ways, it healed me. Like, he knew he was dealing with a very skittish, kind of like wounded animal, and, but he, he just knew what to do. 
And who knew that that person that I wished for and prayed for was gonna be white? And it was so easy. It was just so easy to fall in love. Is it all right for me to feel this way? Put my head in your lap. The world will go away. Well, well, we can go there. We can go anywhere. We can go there. Yes. But is it all right? He's white, but he's such a great guy. He's so kind to me, I love him. He's white. What's my family gonna say? What's my community gonna say? But I love being with him. Like I was just this back and forth and back and forth. Finally, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna tell him the big one. So I remember calling him and just being like, you know what, Keith, I just, I love you, care about you, but you know, I've been meaning, I, I've been scared to tell you this, but, after everything I've been through and seen in my life, in my life, and I've been brought up with and the history of our people, I need to have Native children. And I was just, the, the, the phone went silent and I was just like cringing, okay, he's gonna say, well, I thought he was gonna say, well, okay, I can't really help you with that. <laughs> the end, that's the end of that. And he said the most unbelievable thing to me. He said, Wanique, I will never ever stop you from doing what you need to do for your people. I just wanna be there to help you raise the kids. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I was like, I remember being on the other, the other line going, oh my God, I'm like, it's unconditional. That's like, it's, and I'm like to myself, am I, I'm really worth that? Like, here's someone who's willing to, to do that and I'm, I was just so um, astounded by that statement and I thought to myself, I can't give him up. I can't give him up because I needed him and he wasn't ever gonna make me, he was just gonna help me and I just didn't, I needed that. And, and he um, has always stood by that statement, always stood by that statement and uh, and and he's backed it up with his his kindness to my family and kindness to my community and most of all his kindness to me he's like you are your own person you're a mohawk woman and that's you and i just want to kind of coexist with you <laughs> By the way, the reaction on both of us was like a big smile, just like this, like, aw. And I told him that, like, I have to have the baby at home. I'm gonna walk it. I needed the women's support and being on native land, like back grounded, you know, back on my own soil where I feel like my power, like my major power is. I'm always like, come on, aren't you gonna touch my belly? Aren't you gonna pay attention to the belly? Aren't you thinking about the belly? About the baby? Because like, you know, obviously like I, like I have it every day. I have it every second. <coughs> belly worship, mister. Yeah, well, there's those moments though when, when it kicks. Uh, there's those moments when, um, I feel the movement, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh my god, and I can see it, I can see a little person. It's like peeling away layers and getting to the core of me and who I am, even before being Mohawk. I'm a human, and it's almost peeled it right back to that layer. And I'm looking at him, human to human, <laughs> we're the same species. You <laughs> know, like it's been that kind of re journey and it's been so hard because it goes against just about everything I've been brought up with. And 
you just kind of say, well, follow your heart, follow your heart. It won't lead you wrong, follow it. Beautiful. Are you smiling too? I'm smiling. No. <laughs> <laughs> Trying. <laughs> okay. Like sit like Andrew if you oh. can. Okay. Yeah. Power for us. Yeah. Okay, another one. That's very good, Penny. Okay. The head is coming down really perfect. Okay. When you push, I will uh, apply some hot compress. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Yeah. More, more, more. Okay, another one. Big, big breath. That's good. As long as you can. teach the baby everything that I can about the respect for Mother Earth. Oh my goodness. Oh, she doesn't have my nose. She has your nose. Um, I don't even have a doubt that the baby's not going to have like a, a firm grounding and a firm like pride and background. Like part of a community, part of a people, part of a, a culture. It's, it's, I just know that. Because I could feel it. I'd like to introduce the family. Little baby Luna. Luna, dear Tal. Cheers to Luna! How are you going to tell somebody who to love and who to be with? Or who to have a baby with? You know, you're going to deny a little baby their rights. But at the same time, I'm really torn. I'm really torn because now that little baby who's half white, what if they marry another white person? And then what? Then it just keeps going and then there's no more of us left. So I understand. I understand. I just don't, I don't know where I stand with it. We have to strengthen the bloodline. You know, the, our bloodline has become very, very thin over the years. Somewhere along the way, there's there's a there's a non-native person in in your family like that, and that it 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 weakens it weakens the the the, the system. It's not who your what your blood is; it's who your family is. The other most important piece is who you are, and 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 how you walk, and how you act, and what you contribute. So how do you raise a child saying, well, we don't know what you are? But when you're 18, those people sitting at that table will tell you. I was one of the very first people to apply, I believe. It was in August 2004 that they started accepting applications. And I was notified by mail that I had a, a meeting. The Council of Elders will hear your application December 4th, 2006 at 8 p.m. on the second floor of the Gunnawaga Community Services Building. In peace and friendship, the Council of Elders. So that's more or less what's going on today. If I'm going to see them, we'll see how everything goes. She doesn't seem so nervous. <laughs> I think I am more nervous than she does. Just... I don't know, I'm kind of afraid for her. Uh, I just don't know what kind of questions they're going to ask her. Um, 
uh, if things that mean things are gonna be said to her in there, <laughs> I can only hope for the best. I don't know what, what it's gonna be like. You know, I, I think she's somebody you would want in your community. We're ready, yeah. The process can be very personal and they will be going through my background and will be digging up all this stuff. I mean, like, I don't have a criminal record or anything, but like, like they can bring up really anything. Like, and a lot of it, again, is hearsay. A lot of it's opinion-based. It's very intimidating. Yeah, seriously. So, I mean, it's interesting that I'm playing along with this game. Because I don't really believe in it. The custom, it has its origins back to the Haudenosaunee, which existed for centuries before Columbus. And nowhere in that culture is there any mention of blood. It had nothing to do with blood. It had everything to do with custom, culture, language, sense of belonging. And the stories were that when the white people came and raided our village and killed our women and children, our Indian men would go and do the same, but they'd take back the children and raise them as Indians. So there's a mixture of blood in here. Now the law also says that when you come into the house, you leave behind what you had before. That's gone. You're now part of us, and this is what, this is how you act, this is what you do. And our clans meant a lot to us. It's not to say like, I'm a wolf, and I'll wear a wolf t-shirt and put a wolf sticker on my car. You know, that's not what a clan is for. Traditionally, it tied your people together, and people worked together, you know, to make sure that they survived. We were so accepting of people before. People could be adopted into a clan. We adopted people, whether they were native or non-native. We survived because we have adapted. It was always about family. It was life, you know, living. I went in there all by myself, sat across from this table full of about 14, 15 people, and they started off by asking me, where do you live? Then they went on to say, uh, well, who do you live with? And uh, where's your father from? And are your mother and father still together to this day? Now that I found was a crossing the line. Now they're starting to cross the line. But I answered their questions because I figured they were standard. <laughs> Whew, it went very well. It went very well, yeah. <laughs> That took all of 15 minutes. I didn't think anything. Uh, they didn't give me any reason to think uh, anything was negative. Negative was going to happen, or anything like that. I don't. Know, I feel relieved. It's been like a long time waiting for this. So, I don't know, I just feel really relieved, that's all. <laughs> About three weeks later, I got a big envelope in the mail, a big legal document saying that um, Sandra Sherman applied, Sandra Sherman met with the uh, Council of Elders, whereas this, therefore that, and anyway, the bottom line was uh, Sandra Sherman's application is denied. I was denied membership. Okay, I'll see you later. Okay, do you want to come over for tea or coffee or something? Based on the following, I did not meet criteria 111A. Does not have four great grandparents that were considered Ganyange Haga. And I really didn't see that coming. <laughs> I figured there would be no problem because I do have four great grandparents that are considered Ganyange Haga. Apparently, they decided to single out my great grandmother, Ida Paul, because of her non native ancestry. in my meetings with the Council of Elders, trying to press the issue. Well, what do you mean my great-grandmother's not Mohawk? She's, she has Mohawk blood, her mother's a Mohawk. We have a clan, we were always told we have a clan. She was half French, but she was half Mohawk as well. She was half non-native, just like I am to this day. But she was born here, 
She grew up here. She married a Mohawk man and they both raised their kids as Mohawks. They immersed themselves in the culture. They knew the culture. They knew the language. She did beadwork. She could make she, she could make anything <laughs> and she's buried here on the reserve today if that doesn't make her a mohawk woman then i don't know what does even before seeing her her file you know it was my belief that she was like an automatic like yeah she okay you know and i had assumed that she was going to be uh, accepted her application was looked at and it's almost like there was a preliminary vote there already, saying no, no, no. So it was like, it was already decided. I mean, she didn't even have, I could have told her, don't even show up. It's already no. I knew that from the week before, because we pre previewed the candidates. People look across the table and say, yata hungo hue, because they know, and that means English means they're not Mohawk, they're not native. Um, and, and it's wrong, I mean, because their parent is, one of their parents are white, or they know that one of their great-grandparents, you know, didn't come from Ganawage, or whatever their background and history is, and, and that goes on for generations and generations. And I think it's become a real thorn in our society's side. I left the Elders' Council because I disagreed with the decision. Now they're basing it on blood, or. So it seems they're, they're saying it's not, but the evidence is clear that the four great-grandparent stipulation is basically blood quantum. And that's how we're basing our decision on people's lives. And everything else means nothing. Everything. The membership law has now become something that is uh, similar to the Indian Act, you know, except now we're claiming ownership over it. That was the intention of the Indian Act, you know? That was the intention for us to be doing that to each other now. We have learned well from the non-Native society. We have learned very well from them what to do with our own people to separate us. If the whole point of membership was to build or to preserve the cultural identity of the Ganyakehaga people, I have to say that it has failed. Would it have been different if we had more land, you know? Our land used to go up to New York State and out that way, out that way, all over. Would it have been different if we had more places to live? Maybe. But then who do you blame for that? I, I look at it as I, I don't want somebody from the outside, you know, Jean-Guy, whoever, from Shaggy coming into my community and taking the services that should be going to my family and to your family and to whoever's family in the community who has the inherent right to be here. So we need a membership code to protect our rights and who we are and who belongs here. This is what I was meant to do, kind of. You know, everything's falling so naturally into place, and it's like, my whole life... Hello! The amount of support here with family and friends, and just the fact that Kahnawake is kind of a small town, makes things a lot easier. And, you know, I'm a bit of a shy person, so getting to know some people takes some time. And, uh... <laughs> We're at the 16th annual Gunawage Pow Wow. 
And it's Andrew's first powwow, and it's Casanugas' first powwow. <laughs> Kanawagi is really growing on me as I come to terms with being um, an outsider, I guess. Oh, pardon me. I'm still trying to get a handle on what it is to be Mohawk, but I don't think that I'll ever, you know, I'll never be Mohawk. I'll never be native. So that's where I'm at. Where is my child at? I don't, I don't know, you know? I just don't know. What we do know is that my adorable niece, Kasunugwes, is not considered to be a Mohawk of Kanawage. The current membership law still discriminates against children with one non-native parent. She will have to wait until she's 18, like Lauren, to be judged by a dozen strangers who will decide whether she is to be accepted as a member of her own community. I love Grandma. I understand, like, the fears of a dying race and that oomph, the emphasis on keeping blood in and being as strong as we can, but I don't think that it's right, that somebody shouldn't be accepted when, when they're fully dedicated. He's always, like, so willing to learn about everything. If they respect this place and, and the people, you know, there should be an equal kind of acceptance. I'd love everybody to just sort of accept me for who I am. I mean, I, I can't control, you know, who I am. I was born who I was, just like you were born who you are and everyone else is. And uh, I guess um, just trying to earn the, the respect of, of everyone has been, has been my sort of goal. Go. I've chosen to live here because I, I'm, 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 I'm not ready to give up and leave and walk away. <laughs> my relationship has affected my family a lot. I think it's created strife within my family. I'm very sad for that. I love my family, you know. It's caused sadness in the hearts of them, I think. And it's kind of hard to know that you're causing that sadness and those fights and that kind of stuff. It has been hard for her family and, and there's been, you know, and, I, and there's been a lot of guilt. I, I sometimes feel very guilty or that I've, in a sense, caused that. It's, it's just hard to know that you're, you're, you're a disappointment, you know, that, that our relationship could be seen as a disappointment. That's really very hard for me. I mean, Tiffany, I don't think she'll be taken off the list. Unless she gets married, and unless she marries Andrew, and if she does, well, unfortunately, the membership law right now, it's, it's very clear that she'll, she'll lose her status. I was always told as a kid, you marry out, get out, you know, and to some degree, and people think I'm backwards, I, I still think that too, you know? Well, how do you enforce that part of that? You know, that's, that's another problem. Do you send the police there to, to take them away, you know, and take them out of their house? That's inhumane, you know? And people were going around and, you know, standing in front of somebody's house and saying, get out, and you don't belong here, and this and that. And, and there was somebody in my neighborhood um, who was in that situation, who could have been visited. And I always thought to myself that if, if that gang of, of people showed up at their house, I'd go out there with my hose and squirt them down and chase them away. Say, get, get out of here. Stop that. Shame on you. I guess maybe that's why I prefer going out with guys from town. 
because I just don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about what could happen. I don't want to put myself through that. It's dumb. It's dumb. <laughs> it's just to lose your rights because you chose to be in love with somebody and a paper that says that you were going to love each other for life. What Papa has. But getting married isn't the only issue. According to the current membership law, my sister and Andrew are not even allowed to be living in a common law relationship, whether it's in Ganawage or anywhere else in the world. And that's enough to get my sister kicked off the ban list. But these rules are not being enforced yet, so nobody knows what's going to happen. It's just a nagging fear. What if, you know, what could happen? What, what will people do, you know, or whatever? What can happen? Yeah. And it sucks to have to feel that way. It's, it just seems like it's, it's absolutely important to, if you're a Mohawk, then you should be on the Mohawk list and you should be recognized as a Mohawk. So. Until something actually does happen or whatever, I don't have to face it and fight it and like, finally know where we stand and like what we have to do to change it, you know, or, or we would fight it. We would definitely fight it, you know, because we belong to this community and she belongs here. You know, she, she deserves to like grow up here too, if that's what we choose, you know, and be a part of this community and learn Nguahuaneha and the traditions and all that kind of stuff and just be with her family. Mom, can you bring um, one of Daddy's shovels? Like a good earth digging, ground breaking shovel? Oh, goodness, you're a happy girl today. Oh, we're going to buy you a tree. Yeah, we're going to buy you a nice tree. That is Daganui again? That's the placenta where Gasanugwas lived inside my belly. That was her home. It's a sack like that when she was inside of it. And then when she was born, she kind of broke out of it, came, came out of me, and then that one, that followed. So we saved it and we're gonna plant it at the bottom of the hole so that all the blood and nutrients that help Gasanugwas grow will help the tree grow. Ew, it's <laughs> Amazing. It's bright red. Yeah. Wow. There we go. You have to follow your heart. To me, that's the way that's more important. I mean, some people never even find happiness all their life. And if you for, forego happiness just to stay on, on, the, on the list, then, you know what, like, where's your joy in life? So. I'm packing so that we can pack up the Jeep and move to Texas. I guess like your mom said, it's their life. They gotta do it. They gotta do it. Uh, Andrew's an American and Tiff's a uh, you know, it's Sooner or later, they're gonna have to make up their mind where their, their life is gonna be spent. If they're gonna stay together, they can't be jumping back and forth across the border. With, you know, sooner, or sooner or later, you gotta put down roots. Their daughter's gonna have to uh, go to school sooner or later, someplace. You know? so. Well, sad. I'm gonna miss them. But I know they'll be coming back. So, and Andrew's mother has a right to uh, 
spent some time with uh, her granddaughter too, so. Oh, are you getting ready, ready to go to Texas? Road trip? I was looking forward to seeing her crawling for the first time. I don't know if she'll be back by then. Are you teaching your mom how to change a diaper? Isn't that ironic? <laughs> Ow! Ah. Over. And then That's a lot of diaper. And you kind of take those corners and you wrap them around on either side. These ones here. This one. And you kind of wrap them down. There is a special diaper changing system. There are 20,000 marching today. No breast cancer for Gus and Umquas generation. When I went out into the world, I was armed with a good sense of myself and a good sense of being a Mohawk. And you meet different kinds of people and you just, you never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> I think we should travel and I think we should experience the world. That's what life's about. It's about living and it's about experience and it's about growing. These young people who desire to be doctors and lawyers and Olympic athletes, who knows, one of them might develop the cure for cancer or, you know, like that's what exists, the talent that exists. But that, that talent needs to be cultivated and, and encouraged and that is by kind of going into the bigger world sometimes. The figure on top is the is Lady Liberty holding the Lone Star of Texas. People say, well, you're not Mohawk anymore. You're Canadian. Get out of here. You have no right to be here. You have no right to be here. I'm like, wow. <laughs> It's just heartbreaking. And um, I know that you can't really feel it unless you're really going through it. The Council of Elders met to hear the application. Lauren Giles, the applicant, appeared in person at the hearing. She brought with her family and friends to support her. And then the rest is more or less just a, a summing up of what went down. And here is the page I was waiting to see for a really long time. Basically what happens is there's a council of 14 elders actually, and they will sign next to their name if they see that you should be accepted. And if they don't want you to be accepted, then they won't sign and they'll put an X next to their name. So it's very um, personal and like you, intimidating also. You get to see who signed for you. And at my hearing, there was actually only 13 members present and all 13 of them signed. So I am a member of Ganawage now. And then <laughs> I was like, why was David Deerhouse absent? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> go outside his door and get him to sign. I want a perfect score. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I am. Um, I was really, really happy when I opened it. Um, but I was a little concerned about the kind of clause where we have to revisit every two years. It is strongly encouraged that you develop a stronger connection with your traditions, culture, and language. The Council of Elders wishes to revisit your application every two years for six years. So I wonder, I just am curious as to why that is, but I'm a good girl, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. It really comes down to watching who I choose to become involved with for like six years. <laughs> Which kind of sucks, but I guess I could find somebody around here. <laughs> 
you know, you can't tell who you're going to fall in love with. You know, now she's young, she's 19, and she's not thinking about marriage and things like that. But, you know, you know, you don't know who you're going to meet. It's like a trial period. So I just have to be on my best behavior. So does that mean you're going to watch who you date? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to. Before, I had no rights here at all. So I'm content with my situation now and I will do everything in my power not to, to lose my, my standing here. Uh, but I mean, in the future, if I meet a nice fella who's <laughs> it's not from around here, then so be it. I understand the consequences of my actions. You accept the fact that uh, you can't stay here? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now you have it on camera so you can hold me to it when I go to Vegas. <laughs> Some guy. No, I, I think uh, it's something that should be respected. I mean, these are the laws that we're abiding by now, even though it's something that I don't agree with. I agreed to go through the process. I signed the papers. I signed the contract. I'm going to swear an oath. And I respect this community. And I respect the laws that they have in place. So. Good morning, how are you? Ah, I'm so tired. I feel the same. I just feel like that's actually a lie. I feel <laughs> I feel like just relieved. Like walking down the street and never really felt like I was a part of the community and now especially having everybody sign for me has been like the biggest support I could have. You feel these glaring eyes sometimes and it's like now I just feel like whatever man. <laughs> you want your card? I'd be like, hey buddy. <laughs> Need him. <laughs> As of today, I'm still not on the Mohawk Registry, but I think that'll change someday. Hi, Teresa. Hi. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> I'm looking over your shoulder Hi. while you're shopping. This is the only home I've ever known. I really have nowhere else to go. I belong here in Ganawage because I am from Ganawage. I live here. I'm going to die here. These would, make, these would be a good gift idea for Christmas. This is my home. It's the only home I have. And I will be here for a very long time. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <sighs> I would like for my family, Keith and our future rugrats, to be seen as full participating members of this community, whether they're our adopted children or our, our biological children. I, I just, it's such a bad thing to want to have a baby with the man I love, you know? Um, maybe that's selfish. Maybe it is, but I, don't think, I so. think you, you know, he's, he's said to me, whatever you need. And, uh, and I know that he deserves, like, to be, to have a child of his own. So we're going to have one of those, you know, Brangelina families, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> With a, some of ours, some of theirs, some of mine, who knows? Hopefully the world will judge them not by the color of their skin, but more the content of their character and what they have in their hearts. You know, if they ask, you know, our, our children, why did you have us? If, if it's hard, I'm going to tell them because I love your father. And that's why you should have babies. Hmm. It's because you love the man you're with. So. I agree. Welcome back. Nice to see you. Hello. Oh, I 
no. <laughs> I'm so proud of my sister for not letting the politics of our world affect her happiness. But I do worry about the legacy that we are leaving for our children. The power is in all of our hands to make a difference. I dream of a future that is filled with compassion and joy because all of our children deserve that and so much more. Everything you got, just move like you're in a groove or a deep valley. Prove you're someone that the world needs madly. Keep the heart of everything near you. Be who you are, or shine like you do. Aboriginal, I'm speaking directly to you. Full blind quarter, third or sixteenth. Res folk, city folk, blue eyes, brown or green. Caucasian features or cheekbones that cut glass. Ignite the future, joined by the past. Rise like the sun, you already have begun. And blood boils even in the weakest of quantum. Stay strong, help each other along to every shade of red. I dedicate this song. Just stay strong and rock. Hey, rock the boat. Don't sink. 